Good morning, everyone. Whoa. Good morning. Welcome to church at Kaiser Christian Church this morning. It's a beautiful day out. It's wonderful to be here with all of you and all of you joining us from home or wherever. Who knows where you might be? I hear stories all the time of people watching church online from vacations at the coast, from campsites that have Wi-Fi, probably a KOA campground or something. I don't, none of the ones I stay at ever have internet access. But Let's just take a moment and take a breath. Just in the busyness of the season uh, we've been in and are about to enter, Oftentimes, even in church, we, we rush and rush and because we're excited. The season of Advent is almost here. Just take a breath. Take a moment. Remember where we are, who we're with, who we're here to worship. Let us enter into this time of praise and worship with just that music. stand and join with me in the call to worship. Our blessed God has gathered us here, looking on us with loving eyes. May we dwell in the tender mercy of God as we sing songs of praise. Will you pray with me? Tender shepherd, you gather us here to dwell in your love and grace. You comfort and guide us. You heal and redeem us. As we sing your songs of praise, send your light into our lives. As we commit ourselves to the ways of Christ, our guide, ruler, and savior, bless us with your presence. In the name of Christ, we pray, amen.
people of Christian faith, we are blessed with the opportunity, the invitation even to interact with God as often as we would like. We have an invitation to relationship. We have evidence in and throughout Scripture that God, in fact, earnestly desires relationship with each of us and all of us. The story is woven throughout our holy texts. From the very beginning of creation to the present day, we have evidence surrounding us that God desires to know us and as much as we are able to be known by us. One of the ways we do that, one of the primary ways even, is through prayer, through conversation with God, our Creator. We do that individually and we do that all together, lifting our individual voices up to God, calling out our thanksgivings, our joys, our trepidations, our worries, our anxieties our hopes, I think if we did that to each other in our everyday relationships, our friendships and our loved ones, we just unload it on them. They might not put up with it for very long, but our relationship with God is different. God, this one who knows each of those thoughts and prayers before we even put word to them, but wants to hear them from our lips anyway, knowing that we need that connection. Here and now in the context of worship, we have that opportunity. We respond to that invitation and that call to be in relationship with God through prayer together. Let us pray together this morning. Gracious and loving God, God of peace, God of healing, God of all creation, God who desires deep and abiding relationship with all of your creation, human beings most of all. Hear our prayers this morning. Be with us in the busyness of our lives to take and remind us to help us to have the, the mindfulness to take pause slow down, to rest in the goodness that is you, O oh Lord. For this is how we receive our healing, are reminded of our spiritual connection to you and to each other, to all of creation. For it is by your design that we are connected. that we might see reflections of you and of your Son, Jesus, in each of us, in each other. Let this awareness inform our prayers and our actions, O God. Be with us as we continue into the holiday season, again amidst the busyness, to remember what it is we celebrate, what it is we prepare for. Give us safety in our travels. Hear our prayers for healing and for your presence. 
for those who find themselves alone or lonely. Inspire us in this season that sometimes feels dark and abiding that your light is coming. Help us to reflect and to shine that light into all the dark places, God. For we are your people, and that is our calling. We know this because your son Jesus came and showed us the way. This bringer of light. Shine that light into this time and this place as we continue in praise and worship, praying together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Special music today. Um, I would like us all to sing together. For most of it, you'll repeat after me. This might sound familiar if you've ever been to VBS before. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, yes I know, yes I know, for the Bible, for the Bible tells me so, tells me so, little ones to, little ones to Him belong, Him belong, they are weak but, they are weak but, He is strong, He is strong. you are Blessing on the children in our lives this morning. Holy God, we ask your blessing upon these children in our minds and hearts, in our presence, that they might be ever mindful of you, that they might see reflections of your goodwill in the adults around them, that those all too often times when they feel powerless, that they might find their strength in you. Amen. Well, we have come finally to the end of this current sermon series on what disciples do. 
don't know about you, but I'm always, already actively looking forward to the season of Advent, which, if you haven't realized it yet, starts next Sunday. Advent is upon us. As soon as the turkey leftovers are packed away, we'll be decorating the church and then beginning to celebrate that time of preparation for the birth of Jesus at Christmas. We look to Paul's letter to the Colossians this morning. He gives a picture of that same Jesus for the people, the believers in Colossae. Your bulletin says the scriptures, Colossians 1, 11 through 20. I'm going to start a little bit earlier than that to give some context. Paul's introduction in common Pauline fashion, he starts by giving a thanksgiving for the people that he writes to. We'll read that first and then we'll get into the the rest of the scripture this morning. In verse 3, he starts, In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. I'll pause there for a moment and, and explain a little why I included that because the rest of the his intro and his prayer points to, as always, a little bit of Paul's reason for the letter, but this gives some context. The people that he is writing to and has been praying for, the believers in Colossae, they, by Paul's own account here in verses 3 through 10, are deeply faithful Christians who have heard the truth of the gospel, who have good teachers around them. Bear that in mind as we continue. Paul says, may you be made strong with all of the strength that comes from his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is, above all, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Paul writes this introduction to the rest of the letter of the Colossians from prison. I think the last few times we've heard from Paul in this 
congregation that's been from prison, which he found himself there uh, somewhat often. We hear in this passage Paul's uh, what could be sometimes described as uh, after the, the prayer in the beginning, a, a hymn of praise and of confession of, of just who Christ is. Strong and powerful reminder, what we call a high Christology, theology of Jesus. Some scholars say that the, the verses 15 through 20 read or sound somewhat like a, a hymn, something meant to be sung out loud to people, something that they surmise that Paul likely uh, adapted specifically for this letter to the Colossians. Throughout the rest of the letter, we get a picture of the growing problem. Paul didn't write to, to people for no reason. Even as he, he prays and he lauds them for their faithfulness and their, their teaching and understanding, he gives this praise of Christ and reminder to them. We have a picture of the city of Colossae at that time and what surrounded the Christian believers there. A cosmopolitan city of some size full of, of Greeks and Middle Eastern Jewish people and Phrygians. All manner of people and cultures and religious belief. And the general culture there in, in typical Roman tradition, there, there was promoted a, a somewhat syncretistic view of religion uh, that they were to be a good citizen, you had to, to honor all of these, or as many as you could, that, that God's fullness could only be known in, in the many parts or iterations, representations, or, or, or little gods that came about in these many religions, that, that all of them must be venerated and respected and, and revered even in order to, to know God fully, in order to be faithful, to be a good citizen has promoted a, a somewhat a pantheon of, of divine beings or, or gods, Jesus just being one of many. This was the, the prevailing teaching surrounding these Christian believers in Colossae. And the people in the whole city, not only the Christians, were desperate to know where God was, where in fact they could find God. And they, they meant oftentimes in a physical sense. Where was God and how to gain access to God? So the many practitioners of faith in that city that would profess from different perspectives and angles and, and with this God and that God that you need this one. This is the path. You imagine the, the pressure and the confusion to conform to be in that city. And so Paul is concerned at what he knows about their struggles in that context and sends this letter with a strong reminder of who and what Jesus is. In the form of a song, even. The beginning section of that description of supremacy of Christ, verses 15 through 20, Paul's tone in the letter shifts a bit. Before that, it was a letter directed and speaking to the people, but here the, the address shifts from the previous verses of almost conversation to, to a grand declaration of the supremacy of Christ. That there be me that there may be no question remaining for those Christians in Colossae as to where their loyalties lie. Who, in fact, it is that they proclaim to follow. It is meant, these 
verses to cement this idea into that community, to encourage them and to remind them that amidst all these various religious teachings in their city, that their allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer preceding this in 9 through 15 is itself a call to gratitude and to endurance. Paul prays for them that they be made strong with the strength that comes from God, that they be prepared to have endurance, to endure challenges, to have patience, that their gratitude itself might be a source of power, their gratitude to God, a source of power which empowers that endurance of the people to have and to maintain resilience. It takes resilience to be faithful, doesn't it? We talk a lot about resilience these days. I don't know if you, you've heard it in, in articles or particularly in the last couple of years when we talk about weathering difficult times. One of the the last two years in, in, in some people's, many is living memory, the, the first time in, in some people's lives that as even a world culture, we've gone through a time of adversity, the same adversity together. And it's taken no small amount of resilience. And we saw what happened when people's resilience for certain struggles and adversities ran out. We've been talking a lot about resilience, and oftentimes, you know, in the midst of social and political and, and other manners of unrest, I hear it most often in the context of our children. Resilience in schools and amidst conversations around school shootings and suicide attempts, and those unfortunate times where the suicides are successful. A lack of resilience. Our capacity to endure, to overcome, to last, to rise above even. Everyone's talking about resilience and, and how we get it. How do we maintain it? Where it comes from? How to encourage it and instill it and foster it? How to maintain a uh, some sense of a, a joy of spirit, this untangible, intangible notion of, of joy amidst the, the, the sometimes overwhelming amount of discouragements in the world. We see Paul here doing very much the same thing. Praying for resilience for people he loves. In the conversations I hear most often, we, we find and I hear people encouraging this sense of resilience most often by, you know, seeking something to be a part of, something to outside yourself to, to trust, to to join you know, some group or club to put your allegiance in as something to foster resilience. It's often some sort of group or activity you know, meant to, to distract us or, or to give us at least some, some small thing to look forward to or to enjoy amidst what feels like chaos. Something to remind us of, of goodness, to be happy or hopeful about. Sometimes it's sports or a civic club like Elks or the Lions or, or in our own city of Kaiser, our, our city's theme, if you will, of, of volunteerism, of investing yourself in something else as a source of resilience. You know, it could be your friends or family or patriotism in your country 
to inspire resilience. Anything is encouraged to have people grasp onto, something to follow, to organize your life around. We know from experience that at some point all of these things fall short. Paul's strong reminder in this scripture to the Christians of Colossae and and for us now is a reminder that the scripture calls us to put Jesus Christ first and foremost. That these other things that we grasp at and are, aren't bad in and of themselves, as long as they are put in their proper context, their priority. Now this really gets to the heart of what it means to be a disciple, doesn't it? What it means to follow. By definition, that is what we do. Disciples of Jesus Christ, we follow. But you can't follow something if you're putting it second or third or fourth. Can you? The one you follow has to be first. Even if you claim to follow Jesus, but your actions show something else being first in your life, that doesn't go unnoticed. It has effect. The greatest indicator is our actions, how we behave. Tells ourselves, God, and everyone else what exactly or who exactly it is that we are following. Whether or not we show up at church every Sunday or, or involved in ministries in our communities. This passage from Paul is a good reason for pause, a good reminder. Because it's not about wearing the right Jesus-y clothes or talking the right way or anything else like that that determines whether Jesus is first in your life. That's just making it into another club. Church can easily become just another club that we have joined or we participate in that supersedes the position of Christ in your life. It's about seeking Christ's wisdom and teaching as your first reaction to any situation in your life, living out that teaching and that wisdom. It's about praising God with your your life as the source of your resilience, a spiritual power that can't come from anywhere else. Oh, I struggle sometimes when I hear people talking about resilience, especially with our children. We wonder, what could it possibly be? Where might this grand source of resilience come from? It can't just be some ethereal concept of hope, a general, all-encompassing sort of thing that they can find anywhere. I believe this real source of resilience, this spiritual power, comes from exactly where Paul reminds us it comes from. From our Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. People desperately want something to believe in not just a group to belong to. We all need something or someone to follow. 
some source of inspiration or encouragement or hope, something to inspire and to fuel our resilience. What better to follow than this Jesus that Paul describes? This image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, This one whom in the fullness of God dwells. The one through whom God reconciled all of creation to God's self. Who better to follow? We must ask ourselves as Christians what would it look like to put Christ first? Now, before you say, of course I do. I'm, I'm here, aren't I? Been a Christian how many years my whole life? We know that the people that Paul wrote to were good and faithful Christians empowered by faithful teachers and the truth of the gospel. And yet they struggled. What might it look like to put Christ first? A story I came across this week about a teacher who was sitting at their desk covered with papers and piles of things, some mix of student papers and, and it looked a little bit like many of our desks at home or work, just a scattering of stuff. It makes kind of sense to you. You know what pile is which and, and what document is buried underneath the junk mail over here or what receipts are you swear you put over there. But in the midst of all of that mess, the, this teacher found a cross that someone had given them at some point that, that somehow happened to be put in the midst of these piles. And they, they came across it one day and moved a piece of paper, and there it was, this, this cross. And, and it made them stop and think for a minute. And, of course, they got distracted. The phone rang or something, and they, they put it down, and it just happened to land on their checkbook. So for the next few days, every time the teacher glanced over at the checkbook, she, they wondered, what might it look like to have Jesus be the, the Lord over my finances? And then, of course, they had to write a check for something one day, so they moved the cross, and they, they put it over on another pile, and it happened to be a pile of their students' uh, term papers. And it got them thinking, what might it look like for me to engage in my work, have, the, have Jesus be the, the Lord over my grading papers, my, my work tasks? What would that look like? Of course, eventually she, they had to grade those papers, so the cross got moved again. The cross got picked up and then put over on another part of the desk on on a, a stack of uh, unsorted photos over the past year of friends and family. And over the next few days, glancing at that, every once in a while, the teacher pondered, what might it look like for, for Jesus to be the Lord over all their relationships? And that cross kept getting moved around the desk, inspiring those questions. We wonder what difference does our faith make in our lives? What impact, in fact, does our religion, what we claim to believe, have on our, 
our finances or our job or our relationships or questions that that teacher found themselves asking as that cross moved from place to place as a physical reminder of of what it might look like for Christ to come first, to make that conscious effort. What would it mean for me to truly make Christ the king of our lives? I know it seems maybe a little strange to ask as we are soon to enter into this Advent season where we we are preparing for Jesus coming into the world as a baby. Where our focus is on the, the miracle and the, and the vulnerability of, of God coming into the world in this tiny form. We remember that this child of light and love and hope is, in fact, also the Savior of the world, God incarnate, God with us. Whom else should we follow? Whom else should we structure our whole lives around but this one I know we still might have that thought in our head. We still think, but I'm, I'm already a Christian. I've already made this commitment. Why are, you, why are you trying to drill this into us, Pastor? Why is Paul saying this reminder to the Colossians who he's already prayed and, and said that they are and described them as, as faithful followers of Jesus? It's just that fact that that, that that reality for them didn't stop Paul from, from reaching out from prison to remind them of their faith in the midst of the many challenges that they face, many challenges to that faith. Remind them of the Savior that they have in Jesus, a reminder that we could all use sometimes. However long we have followed challenges and the struggle remain. We need those reminders of who and what Jesus is. And to reinforce that faith that we claim some more recently, some long ago. The true source of our own resilience and our connection to God. Because we are people of faith. But that doesn't mean we possess an inexhaustive faith, does it? It is not never-ending, without need. For a, a renewal and reminding. Why else would we come around to this table each week. Why else would Jesus give that table to us? But to reinforce the connection and the relationship that God desires with us. To remind us who it is that we follow. And give our allegiance to. Because our faith is not inexhaustive. We need help. We need those reminders. We need a source for strength and resilience in our faith. And like those Christians so long ago, Paul reminds us that Jesus Christ is that source, that Savior, that one from whom our help comes. The one whom we follow. Because he is first. The one we are called to be a witness of with our whole lives. 
that others might come to know God as well. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of response. Number 72, To God Be the Glory. This is Thanksgiving week. For many people, it's a time of coming together with family and or friends to share in a feast and give thanks for the gifts of our lives. On the first day of the week, how fitting to recognize in this moment, we're both supporting the congregation and coming together with family, offering God our finances, time, and talent. The giver of life meets us here as we express our thanks and present our gifts. With joy-filled hearts, let us offer God a portion of all we have received. Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, please touch these gifts and the givers with your hand of blessing. Multiply these finances, allowing us to accomplish life-giving ministry with each dollar. Help us to continue to grow our attitude of gratitude and our desire to be gracious givers, even as we seek to follow Jesus, whom we know as the Christ. Amen. That is what disciples do. We follow. 
We are disciples of Jesus Christ, and so we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus all the way to this table, whenever we gather. Because this is the table that he gave us and invites us to. A table of rest and renewal. A table of spiritual resilience. A reminder of that one from whom our help comes. A source of hope and peace joy, and love, as we will remind ourselves through the coming Advent season, as we prepare to remember and to welcome him into the world once again, the light coming in the darkness. What else could we possibly put our hope in? Whom else could we possibly follow? Truthfully, the answer is any number of things. Really, we have a choice. We know what the right one is. We know what the challenges and the struggles are as well. Scripture reminds us of all these things, continues to give us encouragement. Time to pause and to think. To remember Jesus as we do around this table. For at times it is that memory most of all that inspires us. The memory of what Christ has done and continues to do for us. Reconciling us with God, our Creator showing us the way to true life and life abundant. So we come to the table to be reminded, to remind each other, to be present to truly be in communion with God and each other. We pray with us this morning. Everlasting Father, your word states that as often as we eat this bread and drink from the cup, we proclaim your death until you come. We thank you for offering us this hope even in your death. Thank you for this communion, which is a symbol of the realization of a spiritual union between you and us. Thank you for not only washing away our sins on the cross, but for welcoming us into a bond with you. Amen. We gather and we remember those first disciples, followers of Jesus, sitting around a table and, and in some confusion watching their teacher, their rabbi, the one whom they believe and knew was the Messiah serving them. Taking a piece of bread and blessing it and breaking it for them, giving it to them, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, you remember me. When watching Jesus as he took the cup and he gave thanks and he poured it out for each of them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. Pour it out for forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, you remember me. Let us join together now as those disciples so long ago in communion with God and each other.
As you may have noticed, we mentioned in the beginning of the sermon, Advent is coming, and we will be redecorating the church as soon as Thanksgiving festivities have wrapped up. So get it on your calendar if you haven't noticed already on the church calendar that Saturday at 10 a.m. we'll be gathering here for our all-church decorating party. I think Paul's going to be pulling stuff out of the attic this afternoon and getting ready for that, so the decorations will be down. We'll be, the ch- colors will change. You'll see a lot of purple and different hangings coming into the space. And so If you'd like to participate in that, uh, join us on Saturday at 10 o'clock after Thanksgiving. If you're not too busy sweating over a pot of turkey soup or something, uh, bring it along. Um, also, uh, if you haven't noticed in our bulletins and other announcements, we have a Christmas pageant in the works this year in cooperation with uh, another Disciples congregation that meets at Salem First Church in the evenings, uh, uh, the Chookies Islander uh, uh, Family Church. is gonna, We're doing it together this year, which is really exciting and makes for all kinds of logistical and cultural challenges, but those are all... Uh, worth it for us to be together and to have and to celebrate the season and our our children uh, and so uh, anyone interested in participating in that we have practices starting this Sunday uh, at uh, both of our services so here we've been we'll start practicing and then in the evening at their church at 5 p.m is it six that's one of the the tricky things knowing when our services are and that sometimes changes with other groups and uh, so six o'clock at Salem first for practice there and get to know each other a little bit before the big day which is the 18th and this is our our, our main push for for all of you that um, that feel you know that like to watch the pageant but are somewhat removed from having little rugrats of your own to to ferry back and forth to practices we really encourage uh, all of us to to come to both of those performances here at our church at 10 a.m. on December 18th to support uh, all the work and and both congregations and to support and to go in the evening uh, that Sunday the 18th to Salem First Christian Church to join our uh, our Chookies Disciples Church uh, for their service and to watch them do it all over again. I know it'll feel a little bit redundant, but it means and will mean the world. To them, this is the first time uh, our Chickie's friends have have participated or gotten involved in a Christmas pageant like this, and they are super excited. And we want to honor and support them in that. And so I, I ardently encourage you to get it on your calendar now and plan to be at both of those to cheer our kids on and to have that be an important part of celebrating our season uh, and acknowledging the power of showing up for each other. That's true. The community dinner this week is on Wednesday. It's a little earlier, isn't it? In the day, it's at 3 p.m. at St. Edward's. It's 3 p.m., if I remember correctly, if you're interested in celebrating communion dinner or community dinner. It's kind of both, isn't it? Community dinner for Thanksgiving. Uh, But again, and that, again, is another uh, example of the power of showing up for each other. Uh, how uh, depressing or discouraging would it be to show up to that community dinner and have uh, just one or two people at each table or, in fact, be the only one that showed up or put all the work into doing it and have nobody show up? You'd wonder, why am I doing this? But the power of that event is in that we do show up. People care to be there for each other. And I know you love the children in our community, and so I again encourage you to show up for the community dinner. Show up for not just our Christmas pageant uh, in the morning on the 18th, but also for the performance at our friend's uh, church service in the evening. I'm going to keep saying it again and again. Because there is power in showing up. One of the greatest examples Jesus ever gave us.
was showing up for us. With that, let's all stand and sing our hymn of benediction together. Jesus.